the next one we're going to come on to is is probably one of one of John's most well-known flies. And that's a G and H sedge. I'll just put one in the vice a moment so you can see what we got. There we go. Can anybody see it? Um, this this is is much older pattern than you might imagine. I mean, this again dates right back to the 60s, probably, when John fished with someone called Cliff Henry, and that's where G and H sedge comes from. It's Goddard and Henry. They wanted to catch from still waters on a dry fly. It wasn't being done much in those days. And the only sedge patterns they had, after they'd cast them out after a little while, they were disappearing under. So they thought, right, what can we have which will really float? And this was a time when the Madeleine Minnow had came in, come into Britain. And I think Tom Savile really introduced it. And it was Don Gapen in the States who produced the first Madeleine Minnow. And he was after brook trout. We real, they, John realised how much it floated, because each of those hairs is hollow. This is deer hair that's on there. And it even looks like a trout pellet as well, if you look. <laughs> so, so you actually spin on the deer hair and then trim it to shape afterwards. And it's, there's not no, the only materials involved is deer hair and two cock hackles. That's all that it makes. Originally, when John tied it with Cliff Henry, there was, he put a strip of seals fur underneath the, to get a colour to the body. But now, all, all he did of later years was he marked it with a felt tip pen. You cut it flat across the top, and, and then if he wanted to colour on it, he just coloured the bottom with a felt tip pen underneath. And this pattern is known, is probably, on the west coast of America, it's probably the most sold sedge pattern in America. Um, out there, it's known as a Goddard Caddis. You'll see it either called a G&H sed or a Goddard Caddis. And what happened was, John had, had, was using this, and he was asked if he could look after an American guy for a few days. And this chap came over, and they, they fished the test, and when the sedge were up, John was catching a lot and the American chap wasn't, so he gave him some of these and he started catching lots of fish on it. And so John gave him some and he went off back to the States where he ran a tackle business and sold flies amongst other things. And then it was ten years or more later that John went out there and he realised when he got out there that he'd never told the chap what the name of the fly was. He never told him it was a G&H said and this chap had it in his catalogue as a Goddard Caddis. <laughs> And it's still used a lot today, tremendous amount. I say it's probably the most popular on the west coast of the States. Where they've got tumbling rivers, it will just bob it down all day long. This is what's called coastal deer. And you see, we're, we're only using the very grey piece down the bottom. Where it gets dark and thinner up the top of each fibre, it's not hollow then. You only want the grey piece at the bottom. When you prepare it, when you cut fibres off, you cut a bunch, a little bunch at a time when you use it. And this is a flea comb you get from your pet shop and you use that to get the underfur out. You don't want to spin in the underfur. You want to take all that out before you try spinning, otherwise you won't spin cleanly. And also, we break one of the golden rules of fly dressing that we, we spin on a bare shank. We don't put any thread under the deer hair. Because whereas normally you'd put thread to stop your material spinning, now we want them to spin. Put, put our hook in, make sure it's in firm, because we're going to put a lot of pressure on this. You put a lot of pressure on when you're deer, spinning deer. And so what I do is I go up in thread as well. You see that's a thicker thread. This is what's called mono. And you'll virtually never, oh, I won't say never break in case I do, but the only way you normally break it is when you catch the point of the hook. Don't start at the eye. You start as close at the back as you can but sufficient to retain the thread, so make sure it's locked on. This is another tool. I think Ian McKenzie, who runs Fulling Mill, reckons this was the best tool I ever invented. <laughs> this is for, for, you need to, to squash up the deer, you need to push it along. And all it is, if you can see, <coughs> that's a bio tube with an old button tight <coughs> glued on the end. But you've got to make sure that one of the holes is over the hole down the middle of the um, uh, bar because what we're going to do in a minute, we're going to push that along. You can see that, you can push that along. And also, if you can see how that is um, con convex, 
I can push my put my thread on there and it'll run down right hard against the deer I've pushed along. Right. Because the, the first the first bit near the bend is always the most difficult to put on because as you spin it, it catches on the on the on the bend. So what we do is hold that together, get our comb, comb out the fur that's underneath, and then I just in this end, I, I try and use not too much of, of the, the deer hair. I just cut off what I know I won't want. Take that. There's, a, there's a, quite a considerable bunch there. Come over it twice, but don't put any pressure on yet. Come over it twice. And then as you pull down, you'll see... And then cause where I say it's round the, round, caught around the bend there, you just have to tease that bit round. And you'll see, and you can see how it's flared out. And then what we do is just push that along and then run the thread over there and that's held it back. And this is what we, this is the boring part because I have to do this about probably five or six times. Again. Tease out the under fur. Oh, it's yeah. a knit comb, isn't yeah, it? That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what kids, you, you all know about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think mean, 99p down the pet shop they are. Probably about probably five or probably about five John or six pounds. Buy something, John. Yeah. <laughs> Pete knows me too well for knowing I don't buy anything. Wait until someone's pet died and went and knocked them up. There we go. <laughs> Again, so you've got to put a lot of pressure on this. Again, just put that along. There we go. It just squashes it back. Just so you don't put any pressure on to start with until the second turn. And then, and then you work your way along. Because when, when you get so far, when you're away from the point, you can then use your fingers to pull it back. And then, once, twice, and pull. And that'll, that'll flare around. And then we, we carry on like this. Make sure you pull, you, this is why I new strong thread, you've got to pull hard on this to, to make it a, a secure fly. And avoid any risk of, of breaking that. And just go along, so don't put any pressure on until the last moment. Then pull all that back. I think we'll get one. Don't come too close to the eye at all. Just keep pushing that back and compressing it. Again, you can see how that flares and spins. And that, that's enough. And all we do now is hold that back and make a collar of thread so that won't spin, come forward any further. And then what we're going to do, tie off now. Tie off, let tie it back in and put some varnish there. Now that's our basic, what we've got, which we're going to shape now to make a make us a, a sed shape. You get this proper tapered shape, sed shape. Yeah. The most important thing is, is to cut underneath. You want to clear, clear up. So I'll, I'll, I'll just show you what we do. The most important thing is to clear Underneath, so you actually clear the bend. So, so the point is the point of the hook starting to show. Oh, yeah. 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 oh, it will in a minute. I won't, I won't go, but I think because I've got one already cut to shape. But you can see what we're doing, we're actually exposing, exposing the point now because we don't want to interfere with that. So, you cut it off smooth, then you'd have to take it out. And it's up to you how you, you, you cut this. I mean, I just <clears throat> cut it like a taper towards there. And you can see what we're starting to taper it down. See the shape? We're starting to get the shape now. And you'd spend a few minutes cutting that round until you get the shape. And what you'd end up with is that. Can you see what we, we, we would eventually end up with? And you'll find it easiest if you use serrated scissors. If you, if you use ordinary scissors, you tend to 
push the fibres out, but the serrated ones grip it and cut it. Mm. Right, okay. Now, next thing is, we're going to put the hackle on the front. We've leave, leave quite a space there. Just trim some of that back. And you can see, see how clear the bend is now. We can see we've got the gape of our hook back again. Yeah. Now, what we want is two cock hackles. You can see what we've got here. And, and you can see, I'll pull that down, how I've stripped the fibres right off the bottom half of it. Where, where we stripped it off, that's going to be the antennae. And then there's the piece we're going to use. And what we do is, we want them, we put two on, put them down, back to back, before you tie them in. Because what we want to do is, when we wind them, we want them to wind. As you wind a hackle, it leans one way slightly. But you want these to wind opposing ways, so it actually makes a tough head. Right, I've just put some thread on the front. This, now I've gone back to my 6-0 now. And where, where the hackle, where the bare part starts, that's where you tie in. Tie them in on top. Tie them in nice and securely. Put the thread underneath. One, pull that back slightly. Helps if you angle that up when you're doing it. Do you see what we've got? We've got our antennae. However long you want to make them. Cut them off about there. And we'll, we'll, we'll force them out in a moment. So... I mean, now this can, you, you've got the choice now. You can either wind the two hackles together in your pliers or individually. I always wind them individually because soft laws are that if you bind them both together, before you've got to the end, one's come out. So you can always put your hackle pliers along the line of the quill, not at 90 degrees. And then just wind. Just leave a little bit of gap in between because remember we've got to wind another one along. That's it, wind that over a couple of times, just to hold that. So then we put one in. we we'll tidy it all up in a moment. Then put the next one in. Again, put that long, long ways along the fibre of the fly, of the feather. Again, wind that. And you can see we've now got quite a dense hackle on there. Finish that off in the front. Angle that up a bit more to make it easier to... Because this... The hardest part of this is, 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 is putting your whip finish on under that... Under the... Under the um, quills which are making the antennae. And... The rest of the hook. And only put one on to start with to make sure... I've got one on there, just to make sure that there's one on there to start with. And then, then I can sort of relax a bit more when I'm putting the rest on there. I think I'll put the... Put it round a bit of an angle. Bring that back again. And there we go. There's one or two fibres at the front, which we don't want. Split, split the, the antenna. And then let a bit of varnish just run down the antennae into the into the thread there. And there we've got, I'll just spin it round and you can see what we've got. We've got our sedge. G and H sedge. I mean you could flatten the bottom off a bit more if you want, if you were doing it for a competition, but for a fly to fish with that would be ample. And on the on the rivers you use quite small as well, uh, probably another size down from that. Um, so that's one thing we found of recent years, that the smaller patterns are better. It's like his Polly May done. If you read all his books, you'll say 10 or 12, but really now we realise it's 12 or 14s, yeah, which are best. The 10 was just that bit too big, and the mm -hmm. fish were a bit wary of them. So, any more what questions? What size hook did you use for that, job? This, this, um, this is 12, 12, but it's the nymph hook. It's a B830.